Well, Sig, I haven't seen you since last week. Uh, and uh, I believe that uh, yesterday you were on a plane coming back from Moscow. We're speaking now as President Trump and Kim Jong-un are actually on their walk. Their first uh, sight of each other apparently went well, carefully choreographed, and that's all fine. Uh, so let me, uh, if it were tomorrow, you might have more or less to say, I'm not sure which. Uh, let me start out. Uh, uh, let me start out by saying uh, broadly what I want to do is elicit context uh, and judgment from you. Sig has been in North Korea four times, starting in 2004, and the last time was 2010, I think. Um, so you've just come from Moscow. And uh, was North Korea discussed? And if so, what was interesting about it? Well, thank you, Lynn. And let me just start out uh, uh, to say thank you to the Bulletin uh, for inviting me here today. And, and thank you for the enormous job uh, that you do for, for this country. Uh, I really uh, appreciate it enormously. I also want to thank Governor Jerry Brown for, for coming uh, tonight, and particularly he was my dinner partner along with this wonderful table. Uh, we had a great discussion, and actually we discussed Russia more than we discussed uh, North Korea. So, so first of all, uh, thank you to, to all of you. Uh, yes, I did just come back from Russia. As, actually, as it turns out, uh, it was my 55th trip to Russia since 1992. So I, I've been doing that beat a lot. Um, did we discuss North Korea? Uh, it was a session on North Korea, actually. Uh, Russia, US, a uh, session on North Korea. Uh, it, was, um, it was organized by Bill Potter uh, from um, Monterey, uh, Center for Nonproliferation Studies, uh, and a counterpart of his, Anton Klopkov, uh, in, in Russia. Uh, and so, what was uh, fascinating, and I would say the, the sort of the main takeaway uh, is that uh, the people in the United States who think about how to do North Korea policy, they should spend more time in Russia. Th those guys know more about North Korea than we do. Uh, they know the history of the place. Many of the people uh, that were there at this meeting went to school. They went to university in North Korea. They've served there in the government, you know, for the Russian government in North Korea. They know so much more about North Korea than we do. And they have a very different view uh, of the North Korea nuclear crisis than we do. Uh, first of all, they typically don't get excited, uh, as excited about the North Korea nukes uh, as we do. Uh, and second, they have a much different view as to why North Koreans have nuclear weapons. You know, for the most part, uh, the Russians sort of put the onus on us. You know, they say, look, the reason North Koreans have nuclear weapons is pretty simple. It's because of, of you Americans. But the dialogue that we had, uh, I thought, w was just a superb interchange. And so the first takeaway is uh, one needs to listen to their point of view uh, so that we can be better informed and to realize the world just doesn't revolve uh, around the United States uh, alone. We also had an interesting sidelight was reflections of, of the JCPOA, you know, the Iran nuclear deal and what that meant, uh, and uh, that was interesting. The, uh, the second, I, I would say, major takeaway was that uh, with our Russian colleagues, there were about 35 of us, more or less half split between Russians and Americans, uh, is how absolutely absurd it is for the United States and Russia to be enemies. You know, as we reflect upon our own careers, you know, the Russians and ours, and we look back and say, this doesn't make any sense that we're actually enemies. Why in the world have we gotten to this place? Why have our governments gotten to this place? And when you, when you talk to these people, you really see how much they are a lot like us. Although they have a better understanding of history, culture, you know, the music, art, and all of that. But how much uh, we are the same. And it turns out, I very much share that. 
Well, and you're talking about uh, 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 questions of U.S. relations, and this is before we've practically declared war on Canada. Uh, how would you describe, in overview, the difference from your first trip to North Korea in 2004 and your sense of where they were at, what kind of politics were about, and their nuclear weapons program in 2010? Okay, so let, let, let me first say, I've actually been to North Korea seven times. Oh, uh, sorry. Not, not four. Uh, each year from 2004 to th 2010. The, the four uh, refers to the number of times I've been in their nuclear complex. Mm. So I've been in Yongbyon, the nuclear complex, four times. Uh, so, so I've been there those seven times. And the other three times, even though I didn't get to the nuclear complex, were almost as important because... When it really turns out, and some of the people here, you know, like a Steve Fetter and a Ted Postles and the other scientists, they know this. You want to talk to the scientists and the engineers, not just see the facilities. And that's what I did, even though we were in Pyongyang. Okay, so to answer your question, so 2004, uh, you know, the, I never wanted to go to North Korea. That was not on my travel list. But it was this good friend of ours, John Lewis, a professor at Stanford. And John had been in North Korea before. And he was told by the North Koreans they'd like him to come back and they're going to show him the nuclear facilities. And in, 2000, in late 2003, they told him this. And it was very important because 2003 is the year the Bush administration had killed the agreed framework, the Clinton era, era deal. North Koreans had walked away from the Non-Proliferation Treaty. They walked away from this deal which froze the Yongbyon uh, nuclear plutonium facility, and they built a bomb. And nobody seemed to care. Okay, and that annoyed the daylights out of the North Koreans. So they invited John to essentially show him that, look, we've got the bomb. Uh, and John took me along. Uh, and unfortunately, John passed away about six months ago. But he, he was really the main driving force at Stanford as far as North Korea is concerned. So I went there. Uh, I was still at Los Alamos uh, at the time, a year before uh, I came to Stanford. Uh, and, and what they did was they showed me essentially the, the whole complex, the plutonium complex in Yangbyon. And it was just remarkable. And again, not just seeing the facilities, the reactor, the spent fuel pool, the reprocessing facility, but those of you at Stanford, you'd heard me tell the story. I actually wound up holding their plutonium in my hands in a glass jar. It was a marmalade jar, you know. But unlike this glass, it had a top because that's what you want plutonium to make sure it's in the glass, not outside the glass. And so that, so that it was. So they wanted to convince me then, once they found out I was coming along, uh, that, that they have the bomb. And so... Their program at that point, this was January 2004, you know, they maybe had their first bomb already by that time, but it was very primitive, very little. But nevertheless, what they stressed was that they were trying to convince me we have a deterrent. So that was deterrent. So the biggest difference between that and 2010, uh, when I went back for the seventh visit, fourth visit to Yangbyon, and that visit uh, was, quite frankly, it was just, uh, it was a blockbuster. Uh, they showed us the centrifuge facility that they had built at Yangbyon. And, and that was, it, it was just amazing. I knew they had done centrifuges. There was no question. But, and I also thought when we went there in November 2010, they would show us some centrifuges. But I thought I'd, I'd maybe see, you know, a couple of dozen clickety old centrifuges, and that was it. Instead, they took us in 2,000 centrifuges, this modern, modern facility. Uh, and so there, the main message was, um, hey, we not only have the plutonium path to the bomb, which we understand, you know how to estimate that pretty well because plutonium's made in the reactor. You have to extract the plutonium you know, from the spent fuel in the reactor. They had a reprocessing facility. They showed me all of that. And we know when the reactor operates. You, the satellites, watch it. You know, It's there. So we can figure out pretty well. And for example, today, my estimate is they have 20 to 40 kilograms of plutonium. Okay. The United States, 
at one time or another made 111,000 kilograms of plutonium. So what they have isn't much more than they had in the ducts of Rocky Flats, you know, the plutonium plants. So but, you know, it turns out though five or six kilograms of plutonium will ruin your day, you know, if they put it in a bomb. So it is important. But the message there was, they said, hey, we have the uranium path to the bomb uh, with these centrifuges, and unlike the reactor, which you can watch from above, we built this uranium facility under your noses, and none of you guys knew about it until they showed it uh, to me. Again, it doesn't mean this, uh, our intelligence agencies are incompetent. It just turns out how easy it is to hide. And so at that point, then the message was, hey, and by the way, we now have both plutonium and uranium path to the bomb, and their view of a deterrent became much more sophisticated. And actually, along with that, and I'll come back to it later, there was actually a real sort of hinge point, and, and uh, we focused on hinge points in our study of sort of looking at the evolution uh, of the North Korean program. Hinge points being uh, significant things happened. One, one of the hinge points was, I, I think in 2008, the North Koreans is when they, they actually decided at that point uh, that they're gonna walk away from this you know, give and take, back and forth, maybe being constrained, to they're gonna build an arsenal. And the 2010 was part of the message to us, we're building an arsenal. Would you give us a very broad overview of the kind of uh, illegal commercial relationships or trade relationships that the North Koreans have had historically, where they've gotten know-how, where they've gotten the money to purchase things, where they have purchased certain materials or expertise? Yeah, so that's a, that's a complicated thing. As many of the things with, with North Korea, and, and I, uh, let me just caution you, the more somebody sounds that they really know what they're talking about, the less you should trust them. So as soon as I get to the point where it sounds like I really know what I'm talking about, then, then you've got to be careful. Because we, we, in the end, we, we just we, we don't know. I mean, we have, there's almost no information from the inside. But I, I like to show my, my students. So there are three ways we know something about North Korea, and that's what's important to, to your question. One is overhead satellites, uh, okay? And they're the most watched place in the whole wide world. So we watch them. So if, if trucks move outside, we know that. If they're playing volleyball, we actually know that. You know, but what are they doing inside of the building with the blue roof that they are centrifuges? We didn't know that, all right? But nevertheless, they show us that. The second way, and this is actually the peculiar thing about North Korea. You know, people call it, uh, you know, the darkest place, sort of dark hole of the universe, and, and nobody knows anything. It's the most secretive program in the whole wide world. It isn't the most secretive program. They show us these photographs of first Kim Jong-il, then Kim Jong-un, and they walk around to their different facilities. They show us flow-forming machines, which you need to make the centrifuge rotors. And then the last couple of years, they actually showed us Kim Jong-un with models of the bomb. And so they obviously want us to take away that we think, yeah, they know how to make a small bomb, this thing. Uh, Jeffrey Lewis and others called it, from Monterey called it the disco ball, or then the thing which looks like a two-stage thermonuclear device. So they show us this stuff as to where it visits. In terms of the missile tests, they actually show us the missile test. They, they put that on their websites, you know, and for each of these missile tests, Kim Jong-un is out there, you know, and he's watching this stuff. Then the third way is they allow people like me in. And, and again, when you meet the people, when you talk to the people, you actually learn something about how they think. So uh, uh, from piecing all of that together, then to answer your question, and sorry to go on so long, so, so sort of a quick review uh, of the, the history is, uh, first of all, uh, they benefited from Soviet atoms for peace. Uh, so in other words, uh, after the Soviets really caught on, to what they called the peaceful atom, uh, they educated uh, the North Korean engineers and scientists in, in the Soviet universities. They built the first research reactor in Yangbyon. Uh, exactly the same thing we did for Iran. So it, it was almost identical. You know, we trained the Iranian scientists. We built the first research reactor there. So a lot of the early on, it was part of Soviet atoms for peace. But, but you know, the Soviets told them, don't build the bomb. You know, this is, this is peaceful stuff. 
But so they got clientele. And, and then the North Koreans, pretty much early on, sometime in the 70s, decided to go solo. Uh, and so they did their indigenous work. They did training of their own individuals inside. And so a lot uh, of that work was uh, from people who had been trained inside. Uh, they were very good at reverse engineering the nuclear facilities. So a reactor from the UK, a reprocessing facility from Belgium. Uh, and so th those drawings were e easy enough to get, uh, you know, open source. Uh, and they did that. But it's still, they had to build those facilities in-house. And they did it, you know, by themselves. They did not have help anymore at that point from the, uh, from the Soviets. They never had any help from the Chinese directly. Uh, and then somewhere uh, around the, the 1990s, and most likely the late 1990s, uh, they had help from A.Q. Khan, uh, the Pakistani, uh, sort of the, wa the nuclear Walmart. Uh, so uh, A.Q. Khan had figured out uh, how uh, to be able to access the international industrial enterprises to get the materials and the equipment he needed to build a centrifuge facility in Pakistan. Uh, and then once he finished that, which was maybe 1987 time frame, then he turned his model around and he started to try to sell that capability to countries like Iraq, like Iran, like Libya, and North Korea. And then, so somewhere in the late 1990s, then for the uranium centrifuge program, which is where the North Koreans did not have the technologies, did not have the materials. Then they went shopping and they used the networks they got from AQ Khan, developed their own networks, and they've continued to do that, you know, for the for the next uh, uh, 20 years. It's become more and more difficult for them, uh, but never, and they've also become better and better internally. So it's a combination of very good internal skills combined with, and the best way I can put it, it's sort of greedy European businessmen. And they were men, you know, for the most part. They were, you know, the Swiss, the Germans, the Austrians. They, then they purchased stuff from the Russians, actually from the Japanese. They had these incredible networks, you know, through three-party countries where they're able to get things in. And, and so what they did was very, very clever. In a way, you sort of have to admire it, you know, as to how clever it is, as to how to use these networks to bring in those parts that they couldn't get themselves, but they built the reactor themselves, they built the reprocessing facility themselves, they built the bomb themselves, they built the, they built the centrifuges themselves. So this is interesting. We think of the North Koreans as very isolated, and in many ways they are, but they've been a very important part of this international market uh, for bomb material and, and knowledge. And that would be interesting to keep investigating, I think. So l l let me just say, I also thought, you, you know, because I just knew the conventional stuff about North Korea, that it was isolated. So when, when I went over there, you know, first time, I actually found out they had political relations, diplomatic relations with 144 countries in the world. That sort of blew my mind. I, I thought, you know, everybody was against North Korea the way we were. It turns out it's not, not true. So they were much better connected already than, than I ever thought. Uh, you and uh, your research assistant, Elliot Serban, uh, and uh, Robert Carlin have just finished a, a large study that uh, I think we've done some handouts on. Would you tell us, say, the three most important takeaways? This is quite, it's a very detailed study. Okay, so what, what we did, um you know, over the last year or so, and, and I would say, you know, and of course, the thing I can say for Elliot, that I basically got him thanks to your recommendations since, since Elliot was an undergraduate working for you. Uh, and, and Elliot has been fantastic uh, of helping to pull this together. And Bob Carlin uh, is um, uh, he's often introduced as a former CIA operative uh, who, who first started to work on North Korea in 1974 then worked for the State Department. No, CIA operative isn't necessarily a bad guy. You know, <laughs> so I saw some of the reactions in the audience. Uh, Bob is, is one of the most knowledgeable people about North Korea in the United States. Uh, and so um, uh, Bob, in essence, we use a lot of his diplomatic know-how. 
Uh, and then on my hand, I tried to provide the technical know-how, you know, particularly since I spent all those years at Los Alamos, and then I have been in North Korea seven times. So, so we tried to put this together. Uh, and um, if you look at the charts, this is only a very small piece of this. The, the one thing uh, we try to, to emphasize to, uh, to people, uh, the first real chart on here, is there, there are three parts uh, to a nuclear arsenal. You have to have the nuclear bomb mater materials, plutonium, highly enriched uranium, for hydrogen bombs, the hydrogen isotopes, tritium, deuterium. Uh, and then you have to weaponize, and, and that means you have to be able to design, uh, to build, and to test the bomb. Uh, and then third is, is delivery system. You have to be able to deliver it. So, so what we thought, well, you know, it would be important to actually say, since we're all talking about denuclearizing North Korea, why don't we study how they nuclearized? You know, in other words, how did they get all this stuff? Because they have to have all three of those. How much of that do they have? What sort of a problem does it really present? So that was the crux of the study. And, and if you look at the chart that has the red uh, and, uh, and green, uh, so what we, what we thought is, well, if you break it down the way I just did, you'll see some of those columns, starting with the fourth one, plutonium, uranium, tritium, weaponized nukes, missiles. We also then added imports and exports, okay? And then we do that year by year. And then we compare it in this chart that you have here to what happened diplomatically. Did the US engage with the North Koreans? And how did the North Koreans engage? Uh, and then particularly what we found is one of the single most important things is did the diplomacy result on actually having Americans or international people on the ground in the North Korea nuclear complex? Uh, and many people don't know that, but we were on the ground. You know, those inspectors were on the ground during the Clinton administration agreed framework and partly into Bush. So uh, what, what we thought is we'd go ahead and we develop this history. So we've got 26 years here. We have all of these columns. So, you know, that's 200 some boxes. Each one of those boxes has a narrative that goes with it. And so we try to explain how did this all come about? And then, actually, it turns out in the middle of the night, some time when I woke up, I remembered hearing, uh, you know, that people in Washington don't read. <laughs> and so I said, well, you know, what, what is, gonna, is a couple hundred pages going to do for us? Not much. And so, but I also heard that um, uh, we have a president who likes killer graphics. And so I thought, ah, I got it, color. And so we decided to try to show this whole picture's in three shades of green, green being good from a US standpoint, and three shades of red, red being bad. Uh, and so that's what this is. And, and so the idea is now you can look at this and you can follow how this program developed. And then in the charts which you can look up at the Stanford website, uh, we actually show in blue lines the hinge points that, that happened. Uh, to demonstrate, for the most part, uh, what were the key aspects. Okay, so sorry to go on for so long, but so, so three uh, important takeaways. So one is, if a, a lot of people have said, you know what the North Koreans have done, they, they have a provocation, and then they look for appeasement, and you go back and forth. This isn't a matter of provocation. I mean, their drive to nuclear weapons has been deliberate and determined, you know. So, Occasionally, it slowed down, like, as you can see, the green early on during Clinton administration. In some cases, actually reversed a bit, if you do diplomacy just right, but they never gave up the hedges or the options. So they were determined to have a nuclear program. Uh, and then what takes more than this particular chart, sort of the rest of the story, is as we look at it, as I look at it from a US standpoint, probably the single most important thing that we've done wrong, as you look at the administrations, one administration after another, is that we tried to drive North Korea's nuclear risk to zero. Uh, in other words, we made the decision they can't do that. So if they cheated or if they hedged a little bit, so instead of managing the risk, we tried to avoid the risk. And that's the message here. Don't try to completely avoid the risk. Try to understand the risk, manage the risk. 
then you make much better decisions uh, when you manage those risks. So, so that's, that's an extremely uh, important uh, takeaway. And those are probably the, the two most important takeaways. Okay, I'm going to ask you uh, one short question, and uh, I actually answer. need a short answer. You want a short answer. And then my phone's going to go off. So if you'd shut it off, that would be great. Um, what do you think is going to happen? Okay. <laughs> oh, oh, that's a very short answer. I don't have the faintest idea <laughs> uh, of what's going to go on. So what we thought should happen, that allows me uh, to do the rest of the story. So what we laid out here was to say, all right, so how do we denuclearize? So the chart with just the gray, that shows the components uh, of the North Korean nuclear program, okay? Uh, nuclear weapons, personnel, nuclear tests, and then a little more detail. And then I show, okay, so one of the things that could happen, the next chart that has the one red column, this is the chart from Washington uh, that our National Security Advisor, John Bolton, has advocated, and that is everything out immediately. So you look at all of those pieces, they're all high risk, they can't exist, they gotta go now, okay? Well, that's not gonna happen. Okay, second, some people in Washington are a little more thoughtful, and they say, okay, it's gonna take longer, but still everything has to go. It's all red, it's gotta go. All right, so then comes our answer, uh, and that's the next chart to say, Look, everything red from everything having to go, it's not going to happen that way either. Some of the risks are manageable. And we should admit that up front, and we should design the process to manage those risks. And if you go to the last chart, we actually put some words to that uh, and provide a possible vision for where it could go. So what, I, what I'm hoping is that what the president will do uh, in his first minute uh, of meeting Kim Jong-un, he sees some sort of rapport and says, we can work through this, and they decide we're going to do this, and then they give it to the next echelon of people who can actually work through these issues. And then my hope is, when you go that next stage, that you actually recognize you can't do this instantly, and the president has said, but of course, he said a lot of things, but he said it's going to be a process. This is a process. It's a process that's going to take some time. And if you take an approach something along these lines, we'd actually have a chance that eventually, you know, Kim Jong-un may actually decide uh, those weapons are more trouble than they're worth. But that's a long walk.